Thank you very much for allowing me to participate with you in this manner. I uh, am particularly interested in this discussion here today because it reminds me a whole lot uh, of that period in my history when I uh, uh, re reflected upon uh, the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, all of us uh, were uh, quite dismayed uh, at the uh, time of his death, with where the country was headed. And I often think, in fact, every year, I reread his letter from the Birmingham City Jail. And I think that that letter set the stage for what we see in this country today. King had just received a letter from eight white clergymen who said to him that they thought that his presence in Birmingham uh, was um, sort of ill-timed. They talked about what his teachings were, what his policy was all about, and they said to him in so many words that they thought uh, that his issue uh, was good, but his timing was bad. They thought that he ought to go back to Atlanta, leave Birmingham uh, until the time would be right. King, in his answer to them, started that response while sitting in jail, said to them, to them that he thought uh, that this issue of time was kind of interesting because to him, time is neutral. Time is never right, it's never wrong, it's always what we make it. And then he said that he was coming to the conclusion that the people of ill will in our society make a much better use of time than the people of goodwill. And he felt that time was approaching, that we will be called to repent, not just for the vitriolic words and deeds of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. That, to me, is where we are today. There's a lot of ill will being spread around and throughout the country. And there's too much silence from good people. It's time for us. Black, Rabbi, Herschel did. It's time for us to break our silence. And there's no better way to do that than to express it in the polling booth. Amen. Thank you, Congressman, for being with us today. All of your leadership in Black Jewish relations and in the wider nation and the healing that we need today. I am very delighted uh, to welcome everyone uh, to yet another in the series during this Black Jewish Unity Week, co-sponsored by AJC, American Jewish Committee, and the National Urban League. We are joined today by two uh, dear friends of AJC, by Bishop Kenneth Ulmer, who is the senior pastor at Faithful Central Bible Church in Los Angeles, and by Rabbi Angela Bookdahl, who is the senior pastor, senior rabbi of Central Synagogue uh, in New York. They are both dear friends of AJC. Rabbi Bookdahl is a member of the Board of Governors and the founding member of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council of AJC. 
the latter a program jointly with ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. Bishop Ulmer is very connected to the Jewish community in Los Angeles and beyond, and has a particularly special relationship with AJC Los Angeles. I thank you both for being here with us. Thank, thank you. you. We're honored to be here. It is great to be here together. We titled this session, The Spirit of King and Heschel Still Alive. And there's a lot to unpack in that question. They were the religious leadership icons of the civil rights movement. Their friendship was emblematic of all that was good in that period in which blacks and Jews, and they were the heads, but there were many others who came together to create a spirit. They met in 1963 at a race and religion conference, and then they worked together until Dr. King was assassinated, a funeral that Rabbi Heschel spoke at, and there were a lot of stops along the way, not least of which was the captured in an iconic photograph of American Jewish history, of black Jewish relations of Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel marching hand in hand with others in Selma in 1965. Dr. King was awarded the highest honor that AJC bestows, the American Liberties Medallion. Rabbi Heschel was close to AJC during that year and the years preceding because it was the year of great Catholic Jewish reconciliation, a process that AJC brought Rabbi Heschel into and he had an indelible impact. So I ask my colleagues, and I'll begin with you, Bishop Ulmer, what is that spirit of Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel, and is that spirit still alive? Well, first of all, I think it's the spirit of cooperation. I think it is the spirit of the power of unity uh, that crosses the various walls and, and chasms and schisms and isms that should be wasms, the stuff that separate us, but there is a cause uh, that's greater than all of us that can reach and bring us together. Uh, across our differences. And I think that spirit is part of what we're seeing today. I think that certainly is the kind of spirit that was passed down between these two, two great giants. Rabbi Bookdahl. Hi. I think that the iconic line that really captures so much of that legacy um, is that when Rabbi Heschel marched with Dr. King, he said, I felt like I was praying with my feet. And it is the legacy to me is that it needs to be more than words and prayers. Uh, we, every tragedy we say our thoughts and our prayers are with these families. Well, it needs to be more than thoughts and prayers. It really needs to be action, advocacy, protesting, and change. And um, I think that that legacy is very much alive. I happen to have children that went to a school that is named after Abraham Joshua Heschel. They go to the Heschel School. I remember that when my son was in the second grade, the Jewish legacy of activism and justice was so inextricably tied to the fight for justice for all people that I remember that my son came to me and he said, so mom, do non-Jews celebrate Martin Luther King Day also? And he didn't even realize, in a sense, that this wasn't a Jewish holiday. And, um, you know, in some ways that makes me laugh, but also there was a, a real pride that he really saw that as part of his responsibility. Um, but I think in order for the spirit of King and Heschel to be living on, and not just the ghosts of them, uh, we need to actually be acting more and just 
not just speaking, but really acting more. Um, and, and that's how we keep the spirit alive. Thank you both. Let's drill down a little bit. It would have been inconceivable if we did not include the faith perspective in a week on black Jewish unity. It wasn't incidental that Dr. King was a minister and Rabbi Heschel was a rabbi. They understood this in a biblical way. They relied heavily on religious values on a faith-based mission that was critical to the civil rights movement. Bishop Ulmer, why is faith so central both to that movement then and to black Jewish relations today? Well, I think primarily because we, we are two groups, we are two peoples whose worldview is shaped by a common book. I think that our faith is what frames us. I think our faith is what drives us. I think we, we, we view life through the lens of our faith and we share that in common. Uh, and, and so therein again lies this, this common ground that we have. I, I think it's interesting. I think, and I don't know if we're gonna get into this later, but I'll, I'll drop it in here right now. I think it's interesting that um, the, 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 the historic unity, the, the historic partnership of our, our two groups uh, is not very well known. I can tell you it's not very well known in my community. Um, and so a, a major part of, of moving forward, at least on my side of the fence, is a, is a significant educational piece. It is a significant uh, retroactive and, and reviewing the history, the track record that's already there. And so I, I know that there are uh, many in, in, in the black community who do not even know that there was a, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, don't even know the relationship between Rabbi Heschel and, and, uh, and Dr. King. It's interesting, it's interesting, and I was doing a series of lectures on Jewish and Christian relationship uh, in Chicago and Detroit the week that uh, the movie Selma came out. And I was furious because there's a scene where Dr. King is marching across this bridge and in the original, and many of us have that classic iconic picture of Rabbi Heschel and, and Dr. King joining arms, someone made a decision to edit out Rabbi Heschel and put in another a religious leader. Someone made a, de a decision that this partnership that was so bold and was so significant, even in that march where Dr. King was locking arms with Rabbi Heschel, they edited, somebody made a decision to edit him out. And so mm -hmm. I'm saying that there are multidimensional areas, uh, areas of, our, of, our, of our society that still have these um, nuances of, of uh, bias, et cetera, that are going to have to come together. But I think that it begins with us recognizing that we are driven by a common faith uh, that can bring us together. Thank you for bringing that up, Bishop Ulmer. And I think we can reference that again when we come back to some of the challenges that we need to overcome in Black Jewish relations if we're having an honest conversation and how that decision may have been influenced by the state of Black Jewish relations uh, today, which we are trying to uh, support and reinforce today and perhaps capture that spirit. Uh, Rabbi Bukdal, what are the specific religious values that animated Rabbi Heschel and Dr. King from our joint scripture. I, I mean, I think that Bishop Ulmer said it beautifully. I think that we share common heritage, common ancestry, but also the values that really every human being is created in the image of God and deserves dignity. I think that there's also a master narrative that both Jews and African-Americans share, which is this journey from slavery to redemption from oppression to liberation that is a master narrative of all of our people and we are told that even if we didn't live through it personally we are to in every generation remember what that was like uh, for each one of us to feel that so that we can empathize with those who were enslaved and feel it's our responsibility to redeem so that I think is deeply a part of all of our traditions and that's why the religious language is so powerful 
I will name though that um, we have to acknowledge as faith leaders that there have been ways that that I would say God's name has been taken in vain and to acknowledge something that I have um, recently been thinking a lot about reading Isabel Wilkerson's book on cast, um, which is uh, you know a groundbreaking book I highly recommend. And she talks a lot about the fact that this caste system we've created in which whether it's African-Americans at the bottom in America or Jews in, in Nazi Germany, it uses the language of divine ordination that religion has been corrupted and used at times to enslave others. And we have to acknowledge that as faith leaders, that some of that divine religious language has been used to oppress others in the name of God. To me, that's a cardinal breaking of the, the commandment of using God's name in vain. That's a corruption of religion. And so I think that faith leaders have to be at the forefront of this fight because both we know that religion has been used to create some of this division but I also think it's absolutely the solution, uh, the antidote, the way that we will heal these divisions and reach our transcendent higher selves. Thank you for setting up that transition, uh, Rabbi Buckdahl, because even if we have a shared tradition of elevation and higher values and liberation and redemption, Rabbi Heschel, when he spoke at that race and religion conference, when he first met Dr. King, he referenced the Exodus story. That's he, right. Uh, he talked about, let my people go, and Pharaoh and Moses, and he said, we're still battling the Pharaohs of society who are not letting our people go. I'm paraphrasing what he said and that left an indelible impact, no doubt, on Dr. King and launched a relationship. But you also referenced the fact that we understand that the haters in society are equal opportunity haters. That sadly, both blacks and Jews have known discrimination. And even to this day, when we look at hate crimes statistics in the United States, the largest percentage of hate crimes perpetrated against people on the basis of race are perpetrated against African Americans. And the highest percentage of hate crimes perpetrated against faith groups the highest percentage is perpetrated against Jews. And both of you, interestingly, had a lot of prescience, foresight, because you were speaking about this earlier, I would say, than others. Mm -hmm. For Rabbi Bukdal, it's now 2020. I know you're very busy finalizing your High Holy Day mm -hmm. Uh, in the most challenging High Holy Day season of our lifetimes, in which everything is different. And in 2019, nearly every rabbi in America spoke about anti-Semitism. Why? Because in the year that preceded, we had awful massacres in Pittsburgh and in Poway on a Shabbat morning. But I wasn't the only one who noticed that you spoke about this in 2018. Were you seeing that perhaps others were not seeing as clearly? And did it take courage to say that to your New York congregation who may not have been ready to hear it? <laughs> uh, it's interesting you say that. I, um, yes after I gave that sermon on anti-Semitism, I definitely had people say to me, at the most important time of the year, this is the problem you think is the biggest problem right now in the Jewish community. Um, and there were those who said, we don't see it. Um, and then six weeks later, Pittsburgh happened and suddenly things changed completely. I would say, I don't think I'm a prophet. I uh, happen to be a board member of AJC. And I will actually say that 
part of what really sparked that was not only stories I was hearing from my own students about anti-Semitism they were feeling in very different ways in their schools, in college campuses, um, things I was seeing in the media. Uh, but we ended up also having a meeting of AJC rabbis with Simone Benz, uh, Benzakin, your, uh, they are European Council. And she was talking about what anti-Semitism was looking like in France and how alarming it was. And she told us that seven or eight years ago, she said, these little signs started happening. And now look at where they are. And I remember asking her the question, if you had advice looking back um, and you could tell us, you know, what you wish you had known seven years ago when this started to happen, what would you say? And she basically said, sound the alarm. Like, th don't think that just because you're in a position of privilege or perhaps what you think is power, that you were immune to what's coming. And we thought we were immune in France. And what she said frightened me. And I felt that as a religious leader, not just frightened me, but made me feel that it was my responsibility to really call this out and draw attention to it in a way before it got too late. And one of the things I think that was very powerful for me is to understand that there was no way the Jewish community was going to fight anti-Semitism by ourselves. Jews cannot solve the anti-Semitism problem. And I just turn that around and say that it is not the African-American community's responsibility to end racism. It is all of our problem. And, and, in, and in many ways, anti-Semitism and racism share some pillars at the core of how they operate, how they function in society, how they dehumanize and put people down. So we can't fight our own hatred without fighting that kind of mindset that is also poisoned um, uh, American mindset um, around race. So I, I would just say that the alarm was sounded in our community, but we saw it in many different ways, um, you know, in, in other communities. And frankly, we should have spoken up sooner. Thank you. Bishop, I think you know now why we invited both of you. <laughs> You have a parallel story, which I discovered. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. Uh, you, of course, are an African-American religious leader. You travel the world. You speak everywhere. You've written many books. But it wasn't until your most recent book that you took on the question of racism head on in a very public way. And what is fascinating is that you wrote and published this book at the end of 2019. What we now know as uh, the killing of yet another unarmed African-American man, George Floyd, he was a symbol, but he certainly was not unique in that regard. And it gave birth to a movement, a protest movement, which is a multiracial, diverse protest movement against these challenges, against racism. I think I felt that the book that you wrote, Walls Can Fall, was 60 years in the making. Why did you write this book before all that happened? I ask you the same question that I asked Rabbi Bookdahl. What did you see that perhaps others were not or unwilling to see? You know, I, I, I joined Rabbi Angela. I'm, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, so I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it was... It was a prophetic seeing, but I think that for me, and again, you're right, the book came out at the end of last year. For me, it was, it was the, the pain of a personal journey. And by that, I mean, uh, I, I sensed that I had been, uh, that I had trafficked on a journey and on a path that had caused me to be on the sideline, caused me to think, well, that doesn't happen over here, caused me to think that's someone else's problem. And I recognized the systemic the systemic dynamic of anti-Semitism, the systemic dynamic of racism, et cetera, uh, and that I had, in a very innocent way, been, been a victim of it by the schooling that I had, the schools that I went to, et cetera. 
And, um, you know, to, I, I began to look at the systems even before the issue of, 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 of uh, Mr. George, of that first, that first killing. But I, I sensed that I had been marginalized by, my in, by, by the road of intelligentsia, that my, my, my academic track had said, well, that's over there. That's not, that's, that, you're not a part of that. And I'm saying, well, I'm black. How can I not be a part of it? But, I, but then I realized that I came through a, a, an academic system that never told me, never told me that there were black people in the Bible. I was 30 years old before I realized there were any black people in the Bible. And I came through an academic system that said, well, any concern about social stuff, racist stuff, uh, 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 any of those social dynamics, that's, those are the far left guys. Those are the liberal guys. You don't want to get over there. You don't want get, to get involved in that. You know, uh, that's not the way we flow. That's not what we are. And so I realized that I had been tracked, if you will, uh, to a position of disengagement, which is why I agree with Rabbi, Rabbi Angel. There's more than just talk. There's a level of engagement and involvement that we must do, but that I felt justified by the fact, well, I know that that's over there. But then I began to realize it's not over there. It's here. It's here. Uh, it's always interesting to me that some of the people who don't like my people don't like your people either. You know, uh, the extreme position. Um, and I think it was just a matter of a late wake up. I call it a late wake up. Uh, and and, I, and I, have, I have stood before my congregation and apologized to them because I had never done um, uh, a, a comprehensive study on justice. I'm doing that now. I had never done a comprehensive teaching on racism. I've been at this church for 40 years. And, and I, 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 literally, I literally confessed and, 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 and repented to them that I, had, that I had deprived them only because I'd been a part of a system, a system that said that's over there. And then in my community, the, uh, as we talk about black Jewish uh, uh, relationship, in my community, it seemed as though any black, uh, those from the black community who have any sensitivity to the, the Jewish issue are gonna take sides on the Palestinian side. They, they're getting the liberal side. So it was, it was a hodgepodge and, and I felt very embarrassed by it because I'm saying, you know, right through here, I need to say something. And a part of that say something came in the, in the, in the painful journey. And that book is kind of raw, as you know, the painful journey that I outlined in that book of how I am still evolving and I am still, still evolving but I agree with Rabbi Angela at the point, and we're at the point now of engagement and being involved. And for me, it's on a level that never, I've never been involved before. I do, I do think that it's really, you know, fascinating what Bishop Ulmer says about just how much we, I think one of the most dangerous things about racism and the creation of a caste system in that way is how much those who are oppressed internalize the systems and don't even, you don't even recognize the ways it's operating on you. Um, and you can take them in, internalize them and just accept that that's the way the world is, which is uh, one of the scary parts of it. But what's happened is somehow this pandemic has ripped open the, and, and made us see. Well, in some ways you started to see earlier Bishop Ulmer and, and probably really recognize. And I think Americans were waking up to it, but we weren't really wanting to see it. And I do think that the one thing that is, makes me very hopeful right now is how much I think everyone has to acknowledge sort of systemic issues that have been operating literally for centuries in this country that we no longer can accept. I, I'm constantly asked, why is this different? Is there anything? Yeah. You hope? I hear that. I must hear that question two or three times a day. And, and my response is, there was a there was a a, a, um, a TV uh, news coverage of a march here in Los Angeles, and in this march, the reporter took a microphone and put it put in front of a lady, maybe a white lady, maybe 30, 35 years old, and he and, and he said, "Why are you here? Why are you out here?" She had a little kid with her. Why do you think it's important for you to be here? There were thousands of people there with this march, and she and he said, "Why are you here?" And that lady paused, and a tear came through her eye, and she said, "Because now I get it." Mm. Now I get it. She, she said, oh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've seen these reports before, but I thought that was somewhere over there. And just like yep. you said, Rabbi Angela, it's coming home now. There's a, there's, there's a depth of revelation and acknowledgement. Wow, that really is a problem. Wow, that really is bad. And I have a responsibility to do something if it's just marching on that street with her kid that day. So I, my, my, my optimism now is this one is different. Never, never, never have we seen this on a global perspective, the death of Dr. King didn't reach China. The mm -hmm. death of Dr. King didn't reach the Middle East. 
all over the world, this one is different. And like you, Rabbi Angela, I, I, I have hope. I'm much more optimistic this time. I am enjoying that AGC has brought together Bishop Ken and Rabbi Angela. I hope it's the <laughs> beginning of a great for many I think years it will to be. come. Well, you didn't know what you were doing when you were bringing the two preachers, so you got a whole nother problem going on there. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with a few preachers myself. I found a kindred spirit. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, there's a, a word that uh, many in our Jewish community know, but I'm going to introduce it to our, our African-American uh, viewers and others. It's called tachlis. It's a Yiddishization of a Hebrew word called tachlit. And the best way to translate that is brass tacks. <laughs> what are the essentials? We know that in the 1960s, none of this would have happened without the synagogues and the churches. It couldn't have mobilized what happened. Faith was a very important part of the movement. And despite the fact that secularism has encroached, it's still very true that the African American and Jewish communities are exceptions to that. Of course, we know that fewer people are going to church and synagogue and mosque, that religious institutions have to meet that challenge. But for the church and the synagogue, for the African-American people, for the Jewish people, their houses of worship have a very special leadership place and continue to do so. So I ask both of you, I'll start with you, Rabbi Angela, and then go to you, Bishop Ken. What does the synagogue, what does the Jewish community need to do now to make a difference in addressing black Jewish relations and finding a way for us to rise to the occasion and be together as racism and anti-Semitism raise their heads. I'd like to pick up with uh, a word that Bishop Ulmer used, which I found really powerful. He said, there's been a revelation. We use that word religiously to talk about the way you understand God's word, um, God's way that we're supposed to walk in the world. I would say that we need a revelation and that's a, a sacred revelation about racism. I think it's happening, but we're responsible for helping people understand that this is not just about race. This is about how we are supposed to be godly in the world, the way we treat other people. This is a revelation and that's gonna happen in a lot of different ways. I'll give you a couple of thoughts. One is it comes through our preaching and through our worship. I'm, on the highest, the, the most holy day of the year this year, I will be speaking about racism from my pulpit because I think that is the most important issue I need to be talking about this year. So it begins with that. It's continuing with education. Um, we have had, um, we have been doing a lot of education, particularly around the racial injustice of our criminal justice system uh, for the last four years. And so we have brought in speakers. And last year I spoke about criminal justice reform and we had three formerly incarcerated um, citizens speaking on Yom Kippur in our afternoon study session, changing people's minds about what it means to give people a second chance who have been incarcerated. So you have to offer some revelation offer some education. And then finally, it can't end there with a lot of good talking and learning. It's got to move to action. And um, I, I've been proud of the way that Central has been working, but we have a lot more to do. But we've been engaged in, in criminal justice advocacy work, everything from raising the age of criminal responsibility in New York, uh, which we helped get passed a couple of years ago, to ending cash bail, which has been basically a way of criminalizing people who are poor and putting them in jail, um, to recently we're looking at how we help, pe help decarcerate people during this pandemic, and we've been fighting for that as well. Um, these are, you could say these are criminal justice issues, but we know that they're deep 
race issues embedded in the disparities of our justice system. And so this has been work that we've been involved with and um, among other things, Central Synagogue does Shabbat services on Rikers Island and has a relationship with the Northern State Prison and runs a service there as well. And there are just those ways that we have to get proximate to the issues that are happening that are some of the most um, vulnerable in our society um, are those who are behind bars right now. And so these are among the issues that we are acting on. And it can't just end there. We're, we're actually taking a look at our own implicit bias in our hiring, the way we spend our resources, um, the way we behave, and not to mention the racism that exists within our own Jewish community for Jews of color. Because we talk a lot about blacks and Jews as two separate groups, but, but we actually have a lot of uh, black Jews in our community and Asian Jews um, and many others. And so I think that there is an implicit bias within our own community around race that we also have to dismantle and, um, and examine. So this is a little bit of the tachlis the brass tacks, as you mentioned, that we need to do to start that work in our houses of worship. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Ken, uh, you're going to have the last word before we turn to audience questions. I ask you the same question. What does the church, what do we need to do in order to make progress right now? I, I want to first of all acknowledge that uh, that Rabbi Angela and and your 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 synagogue and and your your network, uh, you you guys are further down the road than we are. And here's what I mean by that: um, to to emphasize reemphasize the idea of education. One of the things that we have to learn to do, and and we learn certainly if if we're ever going to learn, and we better learn it this year. And that is the involvement of of the systemic dynamics of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, like when you said you guys are, are dealing with laws and dealing with, with, with the government issue, our, my community has been so suspicious of those systems mm. that in many cases we've stayed away from it. And so the, the, the clarion call now from uh, black pulpits across the nation is uh, when you get through marching, go ahead and march. March peacefully, march, 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 but then march all the way to the voting booth. Because, because okay. historically, historically, we have we have, we have been suspicious of it. We have not trusted it. And so part of the challenge that I and many of my colleagues are having right now is that when you get through marching, you march right onto that voting booth or right where they, whatever your method is, uh, because there has to be what I call a bottom down and a top, a, a, a bottom down and a, and a top up. Uh, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm confusing myself. But, but there are certain individual level, but there is a systemic issue. There, there are there are, are laws and there are, are, are legal systems that need to be, be dealt with from, a, from an engagement of the governmental system that historically we have not been involved in as much as we should. We've got pioneers, we've got Dr. Kings, but we need more Dr. Kings on, on, who are bus drivers and et cetera. So, so we're, part of my challenge right through here is the education process. My concern is that uh, um, we don't follow the pattern of Dr. King's movement in that um, there was the affirmation of the problem, but there was not the continuation on the level that was sustained it. And so it kind of died down. And some of the partnerships that we've had, it was, it was, vogue, it was vogue for a while. It was cool for a while. You know, everybody was doing Kumbaya and everybody was doing the exchanges. And then uh, um, uh, a lot of the uh, black, black denominations, the white denominations were getting together and they were repenting and they were uh, uh, washing feet. I'm not gonna wash anybody else's feet. I don't want anybody else to wash my feet. I'm, I'm washed out, I'm done with that because we got through washing feet and went back to business as usual. So I think there's an issue of continuation and sustaining, but there's also the issue of reformation on the level of laws, on the le level of systems, on the level of government, on the level of reforming on that level, on that level, otherwise we're going to hit the problem of stagnation, which I think has been a pattern in the past that we must overcome this time. Thank you. And in this context, I think it's important to remind everybody to write to their legislatures about the No Hate Act, which both uh, the National Urban League and AJC and uh, the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council. Uh, are all uh, supporting, and if you go to our website, it's very easy uh, to find a way to communicate so that we can be assured that hate crimes are properly counted and resources are properly deployed. This is of 
utmost importance to both our communities. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Daniel Silver, uh, who may have some audience questions. Yes, we have a lot of questions that are coming in. And our first question comes from Paula Rutherford in Chicago, and I should know that there are many along these same lines. Uh, Bishop, you spoke about education, but what specifically can the Jewish community understand in order to be stronger allies to the Black community? And Rabbi Bookdahl, what should the Black community understand, or what can they understand in order to better understand the struggles of the Jewish community? Uh, Bishop? I think uh, we, we can never minimize the value of dialogue. We can never minimize the value of conversations like this. We can never minimize the value of relationship, of partnering, if you will, of struggling with it together. I, I think historically, you know, you guys, you do your thing, we do our thing. But I think that one of the, one of the possibilities is forums, gatherings, settings, contexts like this uh, that allow for dialogue, that allow for exchange. Uh, we here in, in Los Angeles, my, uh, some of my dearest friends are, are that's a cliche, uh, but are far, are, not only rabbi friends of mine, but our congregations have done things together. And I know that the whole, let's swap pulpits and on special days, I know that's one thing, but our goal was not just to do an event. Our goal was to develop a relationship. And so I think one of the things that you can do is reach out and be a part of those who are open, recognize everybody's not gonna be open to it, but any opportunity you can get for dialogue, any opportunity you can get for partnership, I think is priceless. I, I completely agree. I think that relationships are what change minds and hearts and um, build bridges. And uh, it's so critically important. I think I, I'm reminded of Dr. King saying that we are all interconnected in, in this inextricable you know, web, this fabric of um, humanity where we are, where what af affects one affects all of us. And I think I will just name that maybe within the Jewish community, this is more for us than it is maybe for the African American community, but there have, I think after civil rights, and we like to talk about civil rights and how the Jews were involved and we should be proud of that. But I think in the last 50 years, I'm not sure that there's been the same kind of partnership. And I think if anything, there has been a little bit of a stance from the Jewish community that um, we're going to help uh, African Americans. And it's, it can sometimes be a little bit paternalistic. We'll, we'll tutor in their schools or we'll offer these services or we'll, you know, donate. And it's not as much the language of partnership. And I think, um, I think about a model of what, what are we willing to put on the line for this? I think um, my greatest teacher in this were my parents. When, when I came to America at the age of five from South Korea, my parents chose for me a school in Tacoma, Washington called McCarver Elementary. And this was the very first magnet school for voluntary desegregation in the country, meaning they decided instead of forcibly busting kids, they would put a magnet school and enable people to choose to go into the black neighborhood for school, which is what my parents chose for me. I was bused 30 minutes into the black neighborhood of Tacoma, Washington, where my school was a majority black, and black students. And um, I grew up singing the black national anthem at every assembly and i was surrounded by a black is beautiful alphabet in my classroom and i had a lot of black friends i went to black church it was a very different experience but when you're a, a child that is just your experience you don't think it's unusual it's just what it is and i remember that i asked my parents when i was much older and realized that that was actually a radical act for them to put their five-year-old korean daughter on a bus to go to this school i said why did you send me to McCarver? You're not like particularly politically extreme people. And, and they said, my mom said, Angela, it was the best education. And what she meant by that was not like we did that to help those poor people in that community. She knew that the best education was for me to learn how to be a global citizen. And that was only gonna happen if I was in a diverse community learning from all people. And so, I think there was not an ounce of paternalism in that, or we're gonna save those people. It was, this is the best thing for you. And I think that the Jewish community needs to wake up to that. This is not just about us helping people who are in need, although that's also true. This is going to be the way we create the world we all need to live in. Um, and, and that's gonna come through partnership and relationship in a genuine way. Angela, 
I think that those visits to the black churches in your youth continue to have an influence on what worship oh. of Central Central. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I only wish that I could sing the music that comes out of the black church. And every once in a while, I slip it in, and it's the best. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that was my favorite activity when I was a congregational rabbi in Ridgewood, New Jersey, going to the African-American churches where they know how to pray. Daniel? Our next question comes from Abigail uh, Pogrebin. There hasn't been a lot of candor about the fault lines of what is said by our respective communities about the other community, the words that hurt. Can you recommend a way to be more honest about educating each other when it comes to our insensitive terminology or language? And Rabbi Bookdahl, we can start with you and then listen. Oh, gosh. I was hoping you could give me a few more minutes to think about that. And of course, that question comes from Abby, who asked the best and hardest questions. Um, Abby, uh, Bishop Holmer, Abby was my uh, former president of my congregation and a, and a dear you. friend. So she threw me that, that whammy. Thank you. Um, and member of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council. Uh, yes, that's that's right as well. Very, um, you know, very connected to AJC as well. I, I think, you know, we need to be able to name for each other that those comments hurt us, and why they do. And we don't do it enough. We get very defensive. One of the things that happens when we hear those things is we cut each other off. We say, if you say that, you're canceled. If you say that. We're not gonna speak to that community anymore. Black Lives Matter is gonna talk about Israel. We're out of it. We're not gonna do Black Lives Matter. That's the way we respond. We cut each other off, cancel each other, and, and end relationships, as opposed to leaning in and saying, this is the moment we actually have to get to the table quicker and say, let me tell you why we're in this with you, why that hurts so much, and why this is not actually a fair representation of who we are. Um, and again, that only happens if we're already in some relationships to begin with. It just doesn't happen um, if you've kind of been out of the, off, you know, not at the table for, for a long time as it is, then it's really hard to be able to even have those conversations. But that's why I actually feel that this moment is creating opportunities for us that we haven't had before to really build those relationships so we can be honest with each other and stay in it, not walk away. Bishop? Um. Wow, so many things going through my mind. Um, when I, when I, my first contact with the Jewish community in Los Angeles was during, in the middle of the riots, the, after the Rodney, Rodney King riots. And it was through uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Chip Murray, that I met uh, a man who became a friend, a Rabbi, Rabbi Harvey Fields. Uh, I met the great Rabbi Wolf. Um, but, but in a conversation between, um, some, just a casual conversation, someone asked Dr., uh, Dr. Murray, what does the black community think about the Jewish community? And Dr. Murray said, we don't, we don't. In, in other words, a part of this education, again, is, is building relationships of communication and, and not assuming that, uh, you know, some of the things that we may see or feel on our side are likewise viewed and seen and understood on the other side. So uh, first of all, I think understand that we're not, we're not monolithic, we're not monolithic, you know, and so, uh, there, there, there are people on my side of town who know two things about the negativity that may have come out of the Jewish community, little and nothing, only because we don't have that much exposure to the, to the community at all. And so I think you begin on honest, honest position of, like Rabbi Angela said, honest desire of developing relationships, but also when those things come up, you name it, you claim it, you accept it, and then you move on, but you don't let that be a hindrance to what can become based on what has already been. Thank you. Daniel, do we have time for one more question, perhaps? We do have, we have time, I think, for two more. Our first question, our next question comes from AJC Honorary President John Shapiro. Do you think that our political leaders are doing enough to speak out against racism and anti-Semitism and hate in general? And then I'll also ask one, one final question. Uh, Rabbi Bookdahl, you referenced hearing things from your students about anti-Semitism. I imagine that it was on college campuses, but perhaps it was in high school. Can you share a bit more about this? See, I, 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 I'm go sorry. ahead, Bishop. Again, on, I, and this is a very, very strange statement. Um, I, I know many, many, many people in my community who don't have an understanding or sensitivity to anti-Semitism as a separate racial or a separate discrimination issue. All y'all are white. 
we, we, we see all y'all as white. We, we see all of you white. And so we clump, we, we, we clump them together. And so we don't, we don't necessarily make that kind of distinction, which again, and I, when I'm, I'm, I'm becoming redundant, which again brings about the value of conversations, dialogue, and relationship that, bear, that, that point out these distinctions, but also that point out the historic hurt, the historic offenses, and clarify them, and then you deal with them. But again, I can tell you on, on, on in many in my community, don't make a distinction between, uh, and, b between Jews and non-Jews in the white community. We, 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 do the, we do the dangerous thing of with a broad stroke, everybody's white or everybody's black. And so they, they, they don't, we don't have a sensitivity of even rising to that, rising to object to that kind of treatment of anti-Semitism, even among whites. We don't see it. That's another part of the education process. Rabbi Angela, your friends are calling in. John <laughs> With all the best hard questions. I'll answer the second one first because it's easy. Um, not easy, it's hard, but it's has a simple answer, which is yes, we are seeing anti-Semitism that our students are facing on college campuses, high schools, as early as elementary school. I named a story of a of a boy in fifth grade who was told in his New York City private school, you know, uh, Hitler was right, and I, you know, I wish that he'd gotten all the Jews in the ovens. I mean, so I don't know where that kind of language comes from. It's unbelievable that you have kids spouting that today in America. Um, in a New York City school. Um, so, and, and a lot of anti-Semitism is less blunt than that. It's a little more subtle um, and, and, and often related to anti-Zionism and, and all of that. I, I think we could write reams about this. All I could say is that it's happening across the board in all ages. And I think that some Jews don't know how to address it. And some Jews have even internalized some of that language um, or anti-Israel sentiment in such a way that they don't even see it as negative. Um, in terms of what politicians should do and, and have they been doing enough, I think the answer is no. Um, I, I would say though that I'm looking less for statements against anti-Semitism or racism. Uh, that to me is not super effective um, and politicians are actually in a position to make laws that will actually change the systems that have uh, created these problems in the first place. So I'd like to see that we put more laws on the books that don't allow voter suppression, that, that end redlining, that uh, create equal opportunities around housing, and that enforce the fact that we can have um, uh, equal education for our students. I mean, I think about laws that have been put in place over the years that have actually made some progress in race in our country. I mean, naming the fact that the school I went to, that was because of an effort our country made to desegregate our schools. It, I can't say that it's all really worked because I look at New York City and we're pretty darn segregated still. So, but I think that that's, that's what politicians need to be doing. They need to actually implement what needs to happen to make a more just, equal society. And, um, and if our politicians are not doing that, well, we've got an opportunity really soon to vote and make a difference. And I, I want us to hold our, our politicians accountable for the things that we actually care about and for creating as the society that we need to see. So each one of us has a voice. Do not underestimate the power of your vote. Um, I'll just end on that note because I think it's so important. But I do think that we need more than statements from our politicians. We need, um, we need laws and advocacy that will really change the face of America. Dear Bishop, dear Rabbi, dear Ken, dear Angela, can I dare say that at least in this conversation right now, the spirit of Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel <laughs> is alive. And what we need to do is to make it contagious and to make sure that it leads to action. And that's what this whole week has been about. Black Jewish Unity, the National Urban League, uh, AJC, the two of you coming together uh, in this way, and of course, speaking so candidly and courageously and allowing the difficult questions to be articulated. They don't all have to be answered, but you put a lot of things on the table today that will allow us, enable us, empower us to think closely, carefully, and with intensity on the challenges that we have. Even as we affirm the glory of the past, we cannot delude ourselves 
into thinking that that glory can be captured without us meeting the challenges of the present. I've been fortunate uh, to be working at AJC now uh, for two decades nearly and an interreligious work. Uh, and as a result, we've had the opportunity to have these kinds of conversations. And to its credit, we've looked at this week in the context of religious expression, not just now, but also because AJC asked me to write a prayer <laughs> cited in mosques, in synagogues, in churches this weekend, and for others to recite this prayer throughout the week and as we confront these issues together. And what my wonderful colleagues have done, and this is where we're going to conclude our program, perhaps with a final uh, note from Daniel at the end. We've asked our young people, Blacks and Jews, and some who are both Black and <laughs> Uh, to recite the prayer that I composed for this week of thoughtfulness and rallying together. So let's all pay close attention. God, creator of all, we pray that our people, Blacks and Jews, come together once again in unity. Our struggle to be free from the exodus to the civil rights movement inspire us. We are heirs to proud traditions that know oppression and labor for liberation. We will not desist until all are redeemed. At a time when hate is rising, we commit to modeling love. Racism and anti-Semitism rear their ugly heads. We will show the better way, how light overcomes darkness and justice defeats evil. There are those even among our own who will divide us, but we will not allow them to prevail. We are marching together again, led by the spirit of Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel, tied in a single garment of destiny, praying with our legs. Our religious traditions call upon us to emulate our God as healer, to love our neighbor, to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, to strive together toward good works and to judge others by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. We cherish religious, racial, and ethnic diversity and defend pluralism as a bedrock foundation for America's future. We reject denigration and exclusion and embrace elevation and inclusion. We pray that you, God, will be with us as we join with our Jewish and Black brothers and sisters to work together in fixing the broken and fulfilling the promise of a healed world. Turn us toward you, God, and we will return to you. Renew our days as of old. Amen. 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 Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Bishop Ulmer. Thank you, Rabbi Bookdahl. And thank you, Noam. Rabbi Noam. We appreciate it. And we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And thank you to our audience for being with us. For more information on Black Jewish Unity Week, please visit ajc.org slash Black Jewish Unity. Have a great rest of your week. Goodbye. Thank you.